And we are live. Uh, how we look, everybody? How we sound? Everything looking and sounding good? No technical difficulties today, hopefully? <clears throat> oh, and Logan's finally here. That should help. All right. Today is going to be a fun one. We've got ourselves a little bit more formatted than normal, which is nice. We've actually got somewhat of an outline, so we'll be jumping into, you know, specific things that we've actually thought about before. <clears throat> But anyway, uh, yeah, so today, as you can probably see in the title, we are going to be switching things up just a little bit and talking more about the commercial side of running and owning breweries. Yeah, so that's a, a fun topic, and we get a lot of people that ask about that. Uh, I think because a lot of people in the homebrew world are also interested in the brewery world, either becoming a, a brewer or owning a brewery or something along that vein. And uh, both of us have quite a bit of experience doing uh, kind of both sides of it, the back of the house and the front of the house. And so we're going to talk about brewing equipment maintenance, and we're going to talk about tap room service, all while doing our normal format where we give you the genus rundown this week and highlight a beer of the week with some stuff. Cool. So let's uh, talk about some weekly updates to start with. And uh, yeah, so hashtag genus rate my beer. We kind of rolled that out this week. Yeah, being a homebrew supply store, we have a lot of people come and bring us beer, and we figured why not make that a you know more widespread phenomenon where people can shout us out on Instagram too, or you know you know Facebook or whatever, and say, hey, this is my project, and I wanted to share it with Genus. Um, so if we get some cool pictures from you guys, and you know some cool ideas and stuff, and you want us to share it to our wall or our page or whatever you call it, then. You tag us in it and use the hashtag genus rate my beer if you want us to actually give you a, a rating. Yeah, we're just trying to we're trying to make this a, a sort of global community. Honestly, if if we can make it happen, of just people sharing different random ideas for beer, trying to troubleshoot beers, which is something that we do a lot here, and uh, hopefully just making making better beer for the world. Yeah, and sharing your good beers with everybody else that uses the same hashtag slash connects through us. So. so. Should be super fun. Use Hashtag it. genus rate your beer, rate my beer. Yeah, yeah. Genus, genus rate my beer. That's the we did a little teaser video on it. If you haven't seen that already, uh, and on to the next <clears> thing, <throat> um, Valentine's beers. We uh, we flavored some beers. We flavored some beers. So flavoring beers isn't something that we normally do, but we wanted to be a little bit fun and gimmicky. So we did a peppermint and a red hot cinnamon uh, flavored. We just took our cream ales and flavored a couple of sixtals of that, so we can get some nice different dynamic flavors they taste great but are definitely not something i would drink multiple pints of so we'll be having a kill the keg today if you happen to be in town <laughs> yeah um but uh honestly the one the peppermint one went fantastic with the count yeah it did yeah that's uh if you want a beer that tastes like a peppermint patty brew a sweet stout throw a little bit of uh peppermint, peppermint a different beer peppermint at it and layer them together bam Deliciousness. Um, Locale beer is on tap now. We did Locale beer version two, and that is now on tap. Uh, that was a fun one. The only thing with that one is it did come out a little grassy at first, uh, but we gave it an extra week for all the sediment stuff to settle out. And uh, yeah, now it's tasting good. And uh, we tried to shoot an adjunct malt video for you, or adjunct grains, I guess, since not all of them are malts. And shot wise, I think we did a really good job. <laughs> um, but uh, camera wise, we had a little malfunction. So that's going to uh, be a reshoot this next week. We did manage to get started on the first segment of Will It Beer, though. So, uh, and that turned out, as far as I know, very good. Or at least the beer sure did. Yes. Um, it is ripping away as we speak. Yeah, so that'll be a fun little segment we do where we do kind of, we want to get into some challenging stuff, so so some fun, uh, yeah, I don't know, challenging stuff. Mm -hmm. So as for coming up, uh, oh yeah, we also got that shot this week, uh, is a video on how to add fruit to beer, and that is a quite lengthy one, that one's going to be full of good nuggets of information there. As well as a couple Easter eggs if you focus really hard on the background, really, really hard. Oh, jeez. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, so look forward to that. I think uh, that schedule actually published tomorrow, as a matter of fact. Yeah, uh, version two of our lemon bar milkshake IPA is almost on. So that is a uh, uh, we talked about that in the hashtag Genius Rate My Beer video. Uh, but uh, we have version two because um, version one already blew, uh, about ready to be kegged and turned on, turned into a tapped beer. Words. Uh, and that one is the one where we actually filtered out some of the hops, doing a different me mechanism, kind of using a hop back. So that should be a fun one. And uh, also, oh yeah, we got to do that uh, saison. So uh, next batch of beer that we'll be brewing in the brew house, 
which is, is that actually today? That's today. Oh, yeah, that's today. Tim's going to be coming in later to do that. Yeah. And uh, so we are going to be doing about a three, four-ish barrel batch of Saison and splitting that up into a whole bunch of wine barrels that we finally got a hold of. And then, yeah. And then pitching bugs in them. Bugs. So we have two of them that we are going to be uh, keeping nice and, well, funky. Two of them that are definitely going to turn into our Solera project where we do a rotating series. Uh, we put fresh wort in it every six months or so and then just see how the bugs rip away and create some nice funk for us. And then we got one that we're going to try to keep clean because it's a pretty neutral oak barrel uh, and we might actually condition that one with some white wine must um, which could be a little bit fun uh, but yeah that's uh, that's the next brew coming in today and then the one other thing that we got coming up is an ira which is in the bright tank and actually it should be getting pretty close to be ready to keg right now nice yeah so that'll be uh, on tap hopefully this week and that is it for our weekly genus updates <sighs> on to the beer of the week beer Not of the week we still haven't figured out a jingle for that. We're working on it. Beer of the week. Bump, bump, bump. Okay. Um, which, today, we're going to talk about cream ale because we have one. Because we have, that's what we just caked. That's actually yeah. the beer that we did with our Valentine's split batch and flavorings. Uh, but we have uh, we have five barrels of that that we made. And so some of it we're going to take off and flavor. We do a lot of coffee beers here. So one of some of that's going to end up getting coffeeed. Uh, and then the rest of it's just going to be nice and neutral. Yeah. So as for a little background history on cream ale, for those of you that aren't familiar out there, it is actually, as far as I know, an American beer, which is hard to find when it comes to original styles. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, sort of a pre-prohibition thing, and it is the ale version of an American lager, really. So when we're talking about cream ale recipes, we're using nothing but pounds and ounces. <laughs> and uh, so it is going to be an overall simple beer, uh, very... Generally, let's just kind of give you a breakdown, I guess, of, of grains to, to start with. And it's going to be usually a light pale malt with some adjunct grains, be it corn, um, be it some just straight sugar can be added. Um, and I've seen them with rice as well. Yeah, I actually use a little bit of rice in mine. I kind yeah. of split it between corn and rice to get the nice creamy texture. I was going to say, I like the cleanness of the rice myself. Yeah. Know? Uh, but yeah, about 20% adjunct is what you're shooting for in a cream ale. Uh, other than that, it's kind of like a ale, but lagered. Yep. Uh, which will um, bring us to the grain of the week for a cream ale, which can also be used as part of those adjuncts, and that's going to be chit malt. Chit malt is a fun substitute for carapils, and I actually use it over carapils because it's, nice, uh, it's got a nice flavor to it. It's a little bit grainy uh, and a little bit puffy and a little bit sweet. Uh, it does add body and dextrins, but it also is highly enzymatic, and chit malt can be really good for getting you uh, basically cleaning up anything else you would get from your base malt. Yeah, and or adding a bunch of corn and the to corn, it. Yeah. yeah. But also I think the flavor itself would balance really well, especially if you do plan on adding um, like dextrose or corn sugar to it. Yeah. It'll help maintain that body of the beer for a beer that typically is only going to be right around four and a half to uh, five percent mark. Yeah, it might finish at it, you know, the ten oh six to ten oh eight. Yep. So. Which is actually another part of the beer. Um, cream ales should generally have a dry body to them. Um, that's why they're considered like quote unquote lawnmower beers. Generally, they're going to be, yeah, really refreshing, great summer beer to drink. And fun fact the lawnmower was invented in 1962 by Sir William Mower, uh, and that was uh, in Pennsylvania on a hot summer day. You're so full of shit. <laughs> All right. <laughs> anyway, uh, so grain of the week, we got uh, hops, hops of the week. Hops of the week are a brand new one that we actually got, which is called Medusa. And we it, did very little research on this. Yeah, but I was uh, going to say, I never did actually research it. Yeah. But it's a, it's a fun, um, I believe it has some noble heritage to it. Only 3.6% alpha acid. So, At least the one that we have. So uh, not very high, um, but the flavor profiles are generally going to be that of like stone fruits. With a little bit of a citrusy punch. So a little bit of a citrusy punch. So that in a cream ale as a late addition, I think will be f absolutely fantastic. Stay true to your noble roots, but get a little bit of a little bit of flavor. Yeah, yeah, because uh, that's, that's part of the, the profile is that unlike an American lager, the cream ale will have a little bit of extra fruitiness in there. Yeah, I think uh, the thing we read said it's like an American lager, but with flavor. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was like literally the description. Uh, more flavor. Yeah. Or more character, that was the, uh, that was the word. Yeah, used. flavor, character, same thing. <laughs> uh, speaking of a little bit fruitier, uh, we decided to do a yeast of the week. Do you guys like yeast of the week? I don't know. But this week's yeast of the week is the cable car slash, uh, well, it's the anchor steam 
California East, lager strain. That strain, yeah. Yeah, California lager. Um, cable car is kind of the one we would recommend. <clears throat> and uh, that's a fantastic yeast strain. I prefer to ferment it in the low 60s if possible. Mm -hmm. uh, pr provides a really, really nice, delicate ester profile to a beer is the best way to describe that. It's, it's if you don't want that full punch of some kind of an American ale, um, but want a little bit more than your typical lager strains. And for the history on that yeast, as it, you, as I already said, it fermented the uh, the Anchor Steam beer, uh, which uh, was a traditionally an open fermented beer. And so to get that nice, crisp, neutral character, an open ferment can be done. But I don't usually recommend it on the small scale because you don't have a lot of beer to not get inoculated, and you got a lot of area to inoculate beer. Pretty much. So, um, yeah, that's our beer of the week, I let's, believe. Let's pause for questions really quick. Uh, I can't really read because I forgot my glasses today, so Logan's going to have to read those for me. Um, someone is saying they tried to do blend 50 to 70% fruit puree. Is this still beer or just mixed beverage? Ooh. Um, technically, Evan, um, beer is about the amount of sugars that come from the grains. So for to be like at least legally classified as beer. Yeah, in the, in the, in the eyes of the law, it's still beer if it's 51% grain. So 51% so of the sugars from grain to be considered beer. Fun facts, but at home, really don't worry about it. Just make whatever you like to drink. Uh, I was really close on the year that the lawnmower was invented, apparently. Uh, I pretty much nailed that estimation. Yep. Your wife just called you out. <laughs> All right. All right, moving on. <laughs> moving on. To, oh, we got our, uh, oh, beer break. We wrote that in. Apparently, beer break. Bup, 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 bup. Do, do you have it? Where's it at? Oh, it's right there. It's right, right, right next to you. Right next to me. Don't worry, we planned this out. So uh, to tell you why we're doing a beer break, let's jump back to a video that we did two, three weeks ago, something like that. Uh, that was our fermentous yeast video. Uh, we did that at a place called The Grain Shed, which is a really fun local nugget in Spokane that not only makes their own beer, but takes locally sourced grain and malt and turns it into their very own bread as well. So when you have a place that makes bread and they make beer, what should they probably do with that? They should probably make bread beer. Yeah, so that's what this is. This is called the Wasted Loaf, and it takes, uh, it takes their Wasted Loaf, and it uh, uses it in the mash to get some extra sugars and some extra conversion. Uh, and this one is super interesting because the only yeast pitched in this beer was a sourdough starter. Logan's typing something. I'm nah. just taking question notes for later. Oh, that's smart. Yeah, isn't it? I thought so, too. Um, so so the grain shed is also linked get it with, <laughs> with, with link malts they're definitely not linked they're just like friendly businesses well yeah they're different businesses but they they, share some share some owners they use 100% uh, link malt in every beer they brew and so they come up with some very very unique beer styles and flavors that you really don't see anywhere else yeah uh, and it's super fun because uh, all their stuff is locally sourced. And so uh, like a lot of it, where the grain is grown is probably, I would say a 50 minute drive from here. And where the grain is malted is from this location, maybe a 10 minute drive in that direction. Or about a six minute run. Six minute run? Six minute run, yeah. Nailed it. Um, so super, super local to us. And uh, they also are working with farmers to create some heritage varietals. Uh, they're, they're encouraging farmers to basically just grow, you know, save some plots of field for them to grow some things that wouldn't be grown Except for, for the sake of beer. For beer. So, first off, this beer smells like beer, which is a good start. Did we tell them it's, this was a sourdough starter? Yeah. This is the one that, yeah, we talked about it at the end with uh, when Teddy came onto the Fermentous Yeast video and was like, what projects do you have going on, Teddy? And he was all like, well, we did this, this beer with a 100% sourdough starter. So, that tastes delicious. It's really, really fruity smelling. It's fruity and there's... It smells like plums. Yeah. You also get the, uh, there's acidity behind this that come. it's like the tartness from a sourdough. I guess that makes a lot of sense. I almost want to say it tastes a little salty too. Probably from the bread. Probably from the bread. I can see it a little bit. I don't think it's like anything blown out of proportion though. Yeah. Yeah, I, yeah. it's plum and like, uh, like papaya and mango and like there's a lot of fruitiness, yeah. obviously from the yeast. The yeast character has um, some phenols that you would get from something like a wit beer, but it's actually pretty subdued. Yeah. Um, maybe more of like a Bavarian wheat blend, which I'm just nerding out now. But with just a hint of sourness. Honestly, it makes, it, it tastes like a beer I fermented um, when I was 
in my fledgling years, and I mixed an Irish ale yeast with a saison yeast with uh, uh, yeah Bavarian wheat which yeast. Makes sense if it's a sourdough starter, you're probably gonna have a whole bunch of different strains. A bunch of in stuff there. going on there. Um, surprisingly clean, honestly though. Yeah, like I would have expected this to be way more funky, considering. What based on what Teddy was describing to us, like they yeah. they like reached into like the slurry of goop and just plopped, plopped it in. <laughs> no, that's delicious. So check out the grain shed. Uh, if you look at our fermentus video, I linked to all their social media and uh, as well as Link Malt social media and their websites below. So yeah, uh, you should look into them. And they do, I believe, Link Malt sells their malt on Amazon too. So if you're interested in trying out some Link Malt malts, yeah, uh, I believe they have smaller. Some- options available like 10 pound bags yeah. and stuff like that so super fun lights are flickering uh <sighs> okay well is that uh is that the kvass that's uh well yeah so talking about kvass we're not going to go super into kvass as a style this is technically technically not a true kvass uh but it's as close to a kvass as we get in the beer world um because kvass is usually under two percent and so that's a that's a fermentation style that breweries don't usually do. Yeah, and you can't exactly like distro beer that's four days old. Yeah, like <laughs> that's not gonna happen very well. Yeah, so this is as close as we get uh, as we get to the to a true kvass in the um, in the in the beer world, and it's delicious. Um, all right, on to our next bit, which uh, is gonna be the meat of this video. Yeah, um, that is commercial brewery maintenance. Raise your hand if you have thought about either working in a brewery or starting a brewery. Well, if you, oh wait, one, two, three. Okay, all of you. Thanks. So, yeah. <laughs> so in the commercial brewery world, there's a lot that you don't necessarily think about when it comes to uh, operations. One of which is uh, <laughs> climbing into an 11 foot tank and having to. Just crawl around in the bottom of it, scoop out large bits of calcite, and then put a very, very large thing in your hands and spin it around. Yeah. <laughs> um, so this, uh, we, we work with an incubator brewing project that's downtown uh, that has multiple breweries that are kind of operating together. And uh, through that process, uh, we have a lot of people kind of operating in the same zone without a lot of set standards yet. That's where I was going with that, yeah. That's where you <laughs> Anyway, there's a lot of things that we're, you know, at, w- while working with other people, we're kind of thinking about how we can best come up with a system of operations that says, hey, when things need to get done, we should all take turns doing it. Yep. So that was for us this week. That was replacing a 9,000 watt heating element in a hot liquor tank. Uh, that was what I was trying to refer to earlier, but didn't really describe it very well. Now you put you know, a long rod inside of a small hole and twist. <laughs> Yep, and yeah, twist, um, right. and then mess up some threads, and then have to go in there with the Dremel and uh, redo them. Only took like eight hours, no big deal. Yeah, but uh, this won't happen again, because uh, with the current group of brewers that we've got down there, uh, we are all going to be doing regular maintenance on this tank, which means for things with a heating element specifically, it means regular acidification. Yep, you got to, it's got a CIP ball in the tank. So, like, you're going to clean other equipment. What we're actually going to try to do is start a regimen um, at least once a month to actually run some pretty heavy acid through that tank. Because otherwise what happens is during the the heating and kind of cooling cycles, uh, we have pretty hard water here, a lot of bicarbonate dissolved in our water. So what that does is it'll actually stick to that element, sticks to the walls of the tank itself, and then kind of precipitates out and so we have to run that acid to break that down flush it out so that we don't end up with a blown up element which is what we had to deal with last week there is a water softener in the building but apparently it's not softening the water to nearly the degree that we thought it was going to be um, and there are a lot of breweries that actually will basically use for their hot and cold liquor tanks they'll use a giant ro system and they will get ro water in their hot liquor tank and their cold liquor tank that's prepped and ready for every single brew day in which case they don't have the same worries with all the calcium that we have with our natural tap water yep so other than heating elements, other things that uh, we deal with a lot is actually setting up a proper CIP cycle for really all the equipment in the brew house. This includes your bright tanks, your fermenters, your brew kettles, mash tuns, etc. cetera. Um, and that is usually going to end up with some pretty heavy duty pumps, yep. some spray balls, and then you have both caustic cleaner as well as acid to repassivate things. Um, which, depending on the brewery, might be done every single day. Um, other breweries actually don't do it every day. So Yeah, we, do, we don't do it every single day. But we do do it on a regular cycle just to try to make sure that we get that 
passivation uh, and pre prevent any buildup, especially of things like beer stone. Um, uh, you'll also need to make sure that you're taking apart small parts. There's a lot of things in the brewing uh, yep. in the brewing equipment that a lot of people that are you know, they're used to CIPing and they trust their caustic don't really realize you don't get a full you know everything if you're not actually taking apart and hand cleaning some of these parts. Yeah, unlike your fermenters at home. You probably have a bucket or a, or a carboy that are pretty easy to get in there with a with a scrub brush or even your hand and just kind of wipe them down. Make sure soil is free on every surface. In the brewery world, we have hoses, we have valves, we have little tiny nooks and crannies, and, and all these tanks and all these all Racking these different vessels. And... Yeah, that that really every time we do a, a CIP, which is the clean in place. For those of you that don't know what that means. Um, we actually disassemble as many parts as we can, take those apart, do a manual scrubbing, essentially, of them, right? Um, so we're actually going to take them, inspect them, scrub them out, replace them back in as we're doing a CIP on the main tank, and then making sure that there's absolutely zero visible soil left in the tank before we then do a sanitation cycle and put beer on it. Yeah. Um... What, and there's, there's a lot of stuff that goes into regular maintenance on the CO2 side, too, or how that gas is going to be lined. Um, regular upkeep with equipment that, make, that regulates all your equipment. Um, but some of that we might save for, uh, for another video. So basically, uh, this week's episode of Brewery Maintenance is acid. And lots of it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> don't don't let beer stone build up in your tanks. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Anytime you have a heating, you've probably seen this if you used a heating element. Uh, you know, if you on your hot liquor tank at home, even on the small scale, if you have hard water, that will form a calcium. Like if you if you got calcium rings around your shower head, probably yep. need to think about it too. Generally, Debris. phosphoric acid is actually going to be the best. Uh, I've heard of what is it like? Um, yeah, there's phosphoric. There's um, Acid cleaner number five is actually always a good choice. That's kind of a good... We use cleaner number five and number six. Yeah, number five, number six. And then uh, there's one other one that I couldn't get a hold of. I can't quite remember. Uh, citric acid is actually used a lot, too. Yeah. Um, but citric acid is used as a sanitizer, and it's also a stabilizer for a lot of components because it uh, it's food safe or something like that. Yep. Some kind of a strong acid. And then mm. lastly, I think to talk about on big scales is heat sanitation, which kind of goes hand in hand with the fact that it's really difficult to clean out all these little nooks and crannies and lines and manifolds and whatever you got running. And that is before we transfer beer wort, chilled wort into anything, we make sure that um, everything's been sanitized with heat. And when I say that, I mean we are cycling really, really hot water, usually boiling water at least 170 degrees through everything, allow that to sit for about 20 minutes or cycle for about 20 minutes. And that makes me feel pretty comfortable that all microbes in there are now dead and nothing's going to infect our beer. Yeah. Um, heat sanitation works a lot better than star sand on the big scale for reasons. Oh, because stainless <laughs> is heat conductive. Did you say that already? I was, I was about to say that. So stainless is super heat conductive, which means if you've got really hot stuff close to, I'm also just realizing that I started, the, I didn't, uh, I didn't delay the start of this yesterday. That's why we have those comments up there. Oh, gotcha. My bad. Um, but uh, yeah, so because uh, stainless is conductive, if you have really hot stuff right here and you've got a, the end of a ball valve right here, a butterfly valve right here, it'll get that part hot too. So kill stuff far away. Kill stuff with heat when you got stainless. That's actually one of the beauty, <clears throat> beautiful things about stainless versus like PET or other things like that that'll melt when yeah. they get hot. Anyway, and then our next topic is actually going to be uh, counter service, which is something that you're much more familiar with. Yeah. Uh, so I, I've come from the restaurant industry. Um, that I've done things like managed restaurants, worked in restaurants, bartended, served, all that. And uh, going from the restaurant industry to the brewery industry, there are a lot of people that have this hiccup when it comes to um, not being, they're used to table service, uh, especially where we're from. There's a lot of people getting trained, I guess, right now, because there's a lot of breweries that do counter service. <clears throat> But at the very beginning, I'm thinking of places like Iron Goat downtown that does only counter service. And, uh, and people were apprehensive. They would, they would sit down, they'd wait for somebody to serve them, and they'd say, why am I not getting served? This is weird. I don't like this. And then they'd complain. Um, but what we're here to say is counter service is actually the best type of service for a good brewery or a good beer bar. Uh, and the biggest reason why is personal connection. Yep. So when people come up to the bar and they – 
most people are going to be curious about the beer, especially when you, we're like us and really don't have any descriptions. We're just like random beer name up there, and they're like, I don't even know what kind of beer that is. Yeah. Uh, but that allows us as a server, us especially as a brewer, which is kind of unique in a lot of situations, to really describe the beers, really to kind of find the, the, the right beer for the person, as well as allow them to sample different beers, explain the styles, explain the flavors to them. Exactly. If a person were to be sitting down and they'd ask about a certain beer and then they wanted to try certain beers, it would take us a lot more. It'd probably take us five or 10 minutes to actually yeah. go and talk about beers, give them samples. But uh, when they come to the counter and the taps are right behind us, we can create an experience with them, which that's the best thing about connecting with people in a brewery, especially connecting with the brewers or the bartenders in a brewery, if they know beer very well, is you can that's that's their goal they want to create that connection and they want to build that experience with you if someone comes in they're like i don't know what i want i usually drink like this i don't even have to think i can reach behind me say this is the closest thing we have and this is why i think you'll like it or we don't have anything similar to that but let me give a solid guess at what you're gonna like to drink yeah which kind of goes hand in hand with honestly serving experience too yeah um which is something that that if you don't have any experience, you'll, you'll pick up pretty quickly. Uh, honestly, I'd recommend if you don't, uh, try. I, th I think the best thing that, that I, I did before I really got into the serving side of things was um, as a home brewer, I did not one but two of my friend's weddings. Yeah. Uh, and I, I brewed up like four or five batches of beer for their wedding to go serve there. And so kind of it's a, it's a great way to kind of intro into the serving thing to, to figure out really what people like for beer styles. Yeah. I did at least three weddings. That's cause I'm better. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, but, uh, it, people will be apprehensive. And a lot of people even here, you know, as people our regular customers are kind of used to what we do, people will s still come in that are new and they'll sit down and not know exactly what's going on or exactly how it works. Uh, but it is really easy from the counter to kind of start a conversation. And that's important for the bartender to do yeah. is, you know, say, Hey, how's it going? Uh, let me know if you've got any questions or, you know, uh, what style of beer are you interested in? What, uh, what do you normally drink? Are you here for yep. this or this? And then they kind of get it as you're talking to them in a very casual and, and nice way that it's going to be a better experience if they're closer to the bar where I can hand them samples. Yeah. And I think that overall, <clears throat> It depends too a lot on what experience you're going for as a business. And, you know, from what I've seen, breweries are generally going to be different than restaurants. So restaurants are, are much more of a, hey, put you in the corner, do your own thing. Breweries, however, almost all of them seem to be a much more social environment. And, yeah. and that's that's the other thing that bar service really changes is it makes people get out of their seat, go talk with us, but then hopefully go back and maybe talk to some stranger that they happen to be sitting next to or standing next to um, and really, really kind of grow that whole social experience. Exactly. And that's uh, the best thing when I was a bar manager, the best thing that I learned is that being in the service world, especially when it comes to alcohol, is not about you know, not about the food, not about the drinks. Those things help for sure. Cause you don't want people to have a bad experience. You want them to have something memorable with the food and the drinks, but it's about creating experiences. Uh, if you create a positive experience for someone, then they associate your location uh, with happy thoughts, basically with good memories. And that's where they want to come back to. Uh, and if you create personal connections, then you start to build regulars and regulars are going to be really the foundation of creating a successful and stable beer bar. Um, all right. So that's it for why counter Sorry, service typing. is better for beer bar. Yup. All right. Well, I guess uh, that's kind of it for today. A little bit shorter, um, but we're going to do some Q&A at the end and start off with a couple questions I saw earlier on. Um, somebody was asking about souring without hops. And uh, yeah, that's actually a really common thing. As a matter of fact, the Saison that we're brewing today um, does have hops, but it will add up to an entire two IBUs. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so hops are actually used as a selective, uh, to create a selective medium in your wort, basically. So what hops will do is they will uh, give you protection against certain microbes and they will inhibit against other microbes. Uh, what that means is, well, for, for, for example, lactobacillus normally does not like hops at all. Some lactobacillus mm -hmm. strains will start to be really inhibited by like six to eight IBUs. Yeah, yeah less than 10. There uh -huh. are a few lactobacillus strains that are uh, hop tolerant, if you will, that can withstand up to 30 IBUs, but those are very, very rare. 
Lactobacillus is kind of a wuss. Um, but it really yeah. is. Um, sours without hops can totally be done. Uh, what I actually usually do if I'm making a true sour, which is something that you're pitching a mixed culture in and just kind of letting sit in the carboy for a year, if not more, um, that is going to be dry hopping upon packaging. So when yeah. it comes to kegging or just before I bottle it, um, I'm going to add in just a small shot of dry hops, and that can add a lot of characteristics to the beer. And there is, there are ways to get that hot bitterness as well on the same kind of, uh, you know, on the on the late end. Um, things like French pressing your hops. I've seen people do that, uh, or on the larger scale, something similar where you're kind of using hot water and creating an extract with your hops. Yep. Um, that is doable, not super common, but uh, uh, yeah. So use hops if you want to select against certain bacteria. They, it does help keep your be protected against wild yeah. microbes too. Uh, but if you don't, what you need to do is pre-acidify a little bit. Yeah. Brett don't care about hops either. Yeah. Brett will, Brett will take over. Yeah. Rip. Yep. So pre-acidulation is, is always a good idea. But yeah, if you pitch bread, it, it doesn't care. You can hop it. If you're using lactobacillus, try to stay away from, from heavy hops. Um, all right. Okay. And the next question comes about uh, reasonably priced variable speed pumps. And honestly, I don't have much experience with that. Uh, but usually what we'll do is have some kind of a, a valve on the pressure side of a pump. High pressure that, side, yeah. Yeah, on the high pressure side. So, so that's what we're going to really use to vary the flow. Um, generally, most pumps aren't going to be, well, I, I guess you can get a variable speed pump, but yeah, they're going to be pretty expensive no matter what, at least for the commercial setting. Yeah. Because um, at that point, you're going to need a pretty specialized controller for them. Yeah, the one that we have down at the incubator project actually works on it. On a, it with, you adjust the hertz. So if you adjust the strength of the electricity yeah. in it, and it's that's a, how you... And it's a three-phase pump. So yeah. especially on a, on a small scale, like even what we have here, honestly, we don't have three-phase to the building. Um, so that's... I, I would honestly just find find a pump that you can put a good valve on that you can adjust the, the flow rate with that valve itself. It's not going to hurt the pump at all as long as it's on the high pressure side. Unless you're asking for the, the large scale, in which case I would honestly defer to a Facebook group called Craft Beer Professionals. Um, you know, I'm sure they have a lot of resources for, uh, you know, what's the best pump to get. So Damn. a little posty posty on them. Yeah, but on the small scale, we use the Riptide pumps from Blickman more often than not. Yep. Uh, yeah, those actually those are great <clears throat> pumps. Yeah, um, adjusting bitterness in beer is the next question. Um, so somebody just asked about they're they're new to home brewing and they're trying to figure out how to really dial in their bitterness. And unfortunately, that comes a lot with experience. Uh, my rule of thumb, though, for at least small homebrew batches, is that the online calculators that are available out there are almost always going to overshot your bitterness, at least for your IBU measurements. If your calculator says you're hitting 70 IBUs, you're probably hitting 50. Yeah. So um, most, though, should be able to adjust that. Um, at least I know Brewer's Friend has a really easy adjustment for your quote-unquote hop utilization. Yeah. And, uh, and that's going to, of course, depend on your system. But I think as a good rule of thumb, start at about 80% utilization. Yeah. I want to say I even dropped mine down to closer to 70% on, on a system I had, and uh, it worked really well. I think it was much more accurate for the overall bitterness of the beer. Otherwise, I was brewing beers that were calculated, quote-unquote, at like 70 to 90 IBUs, and they were amazing pale ales that <laughs> really weren't that bitter. A lot of our best like true IPAs that we've made, honestly, have been calculated at 120 to 150 IBUs. Yeah. So don't trust that. Trust your palate. Yep. Um, also, it depends on the hops you're using, too. Yeah, um, And that's just going to be something with your local homebrew shop, I, re I recommend. Um, don't it, go by recipes. Ask your local homebrew shop what's tasting good right now, yeah. honestly. That's, that's like, the best way to do so it. So many people will be like, ah, this is going to taste so good if I have this and this and this hop. And sometimes this and this and this hop aren't tasting good right now. Yeah. And so they'll be like, yeah, sure. I'll give it to you. But you know, there's really this other hop that we just got in. That's tasting so phenomenal right now that this is what you want to use. Yeah. And we really don't on IPAs. We don't pay attention to IBUs either. We don't care. About uh, it. we, yeah. IPAs don't worry about it. Load your hops up, especially on the back end. You get tons of flavor. We, yeah, um, we build by flavor rather than building by calculated bitterness yeah uh, and a lot of it also is going to get to go, going to be getting to know your system too if you have a system that filters hops through some mechanism if you have a system that uh you know if you're if you're bagging your hops for example you're going to get lower utilization uh but you're going to get lower pithy material too so there's there to me in my mind brewing good ipas is an engineering project more so than it is an actual recipe building project 
Perfect. Yep. And uh, I think that answers that question. Uh, I see one more. Somebody's just asking for general ideas of going from homebrew to pro. Oh, gosh. Um, I would say get a business degree. Uh, I, and I'm not kidding you there. It's I know I have learned so much since <laughs> I was just an employee for Peter, which was, oh, I don't know. How long ago was that now? Four years ago. Four years ago now, something yeah. like that. And, uh, yeah, really the, the reality that most people don't understand is is that – while there's a lot of, um, I don't, what's, what's the term I'm, I'm going for? Pe- people think that, you know, the idea If of, they're good at brewing on the home scale, they're going to be good at brewing on the commercial scale. First of all, that's yes. a misnomer because systems are very, very different. And getting the bigger you get, the, the more you have to brew on a bigger scale the more the engineering side of it comes into play, the more you have to be intuitive in terms of how to make adjustments to create the same flavor if you have a a mess up or something like that. I think running a brewery, I think the word I was going for is it's very romanticized, right? To be like, oh yeah, I started a, I started a microbrewery. It's, it's, it's such a great thing, but the reality is that first and foremost, you're going to be running a business and running a business takes a lot of work. It's, um, actually making good beer is such a small fraction of it all. Um, it has a lot to do with, with just, yeah, with, I mean, book work more so than anything. I do a lot um, of book work. Or, I don't like book work. Yeah. I don't. Ma- making sure that you have ingredients, making sure that your beer doesn't run out, making sure you can sell that beer. I started the business, this is seven years ago now, seven and a half years ago now. I started it because I loved brewing. I do maybe 10% of the brewing here. Yeah. Pretty much, yeah. I, in fact, Tim does more most of it nowadays. Yeah, especially because you and I are down at the incubator. Exactly. It's yeah. You know, it's yeah. Yeah. You don't. Uh, you got to learn to love the other aspects of being a brewery owner as well. Um, I still get to help formulate recipes. Uh, I now that we have the YouTube channel or with the YouTube channel, that's been a really good outlet for us to be able to really kind of keep experimenting and doing stuff on the small scale and keep our our hands in the brewing pot a little bit more. Yeah. But a lot of what we do is. It's maintenance, it's repairs. For me, it's book work. It's figuring out marketing stuff. It's learning graphic yeah, design. Marketing, it's, yeah. Um, and owning a brewery is, if you're a really great marketer, you can have terrible beer and make a great brewery. That's true. That's if you're a true. great brewer and have zero marketing skills, yeah. your business will fail. I think as a general suggestion, <clears throat> just kind of going into it and kind of learning from what we've done and have not done, I would say, if anything, um, Get somebody to help you out in the back of the house with the whole brewing part of things um, and then spend more time at the bar with your customers serving those people because I, I think when people, especially like if you're going really small, somebody was saying they're getting, oops, sorry. Stop hitting the mic. A uh, three-barrel system. Everyone on that side just got this. Yeah. <laughs> especially if, uh, yeah, somebody was saying they're getting a three-barrel system, which is really small. I'm guessing that's only going to be served out of out of a small tap room. Then you want to build that connection with your customers. I yeah. think I think that's definitely one thing that our customers get from us that they really don't get from even many other breweries in town here and that's and that's the fact that the person that is serving the beer also, you know, made the beer or at least kind of had a say in it. Yeah, was had a, part had of the a process. say in it. Yeah, designed or the recipe, whatever. At very minimal, understands the process. Yes, exactly. Yeah, and, and I think that that adds so much value to the experience of a customer coming in, um, especially when they're coming into a tap room specifically. Yeah, absolutely. And that's why we are hot. Nailed it. Uh, it sounds like at Somebody. all image next most sourdough starters have some. Br- oh yeah. Hand raised, working on starting a brewery, and am I? You you I, can't read it. here. Let me read it. Okay. So uh, next question um, from Robert is, somebody's asking if it's okay to force carbonate directly after kegging. Um, somebody said keg three degrees Celsius, uh, purge with CO two, then go straight into forced carbonation. Wondering if I should give it a day or two to clear thoughts. Um, Oh yes. Yes and Uh, no. I mean, you can, but we unfortunately have had some instances where we have to go directly from fermenter to keg. Um, and you can, you can do that. You're going to end up with sludge. You're going to end up with the same cake and you get on the homebrew scale. Uh, it's always better to have a bright tank system. Yeah, definitely. Um, which can be a keg though on a small scale. Yeah. So you can go from that keg to another keg. Uh, you're just going to lose a little bit of trub space or head space from the trub. Um, but, uh, yeah, basically, uh, what, what we do is we'll crank up the pressure on that. Uh, we actually, we high carb a lot of those things because we want to get them on tap kind of quick. If, if it has to come out of the fermenter into a keg, it's usually cause either we're out of tank space or we need to get that beer on quick. 
and uh, so we'll high carb it at 20 psi let it uh, sit for two days and then we'll take it off uh, put it on tap at 12 psi and let it kind of ride out yeah I recommend personally I recommend findings uh, we've had fantastic success with a variety of different finding agents. We should probably do another video on that just because there's so many out there now. Yeah, the two that we but. use, by the way, are Kiesel Saw and Kytosan, and we use those in tandem back-to-back -back most often. Um, I know a lot of people use gelatin because Brulosophy uses gelatin. Yep. But uh, the two-stage finding has been phenomenal for getting perfectly clear yeah. beers for us. Especially because gelatin's been hit and miss for us. Sometimes it's like yeah. 24 hours, and you're like, damn, that beer's super bright. And then other times you're like, a week later, it didn't really do anything. Fun fact, that has a lot to do with the acidity. Uh, proteins will actually switch polarity at a certain acidity. And so the acidity of your beer is variable, obviously. You have some beers that are lower acidity and some beers that are higher acidity. And uh, the polarity of proteins switching, uh, switching, or yeah, because yeah, the polarity of proteins average. switch, um, different finding agents will work differently uh, so, depending. Especially when you can pick something like this up, which is probably going to be out of focus. But, uh, yeah, Super yeah. Clear is another product that we carry that are Two stage findings. conveniently measured out in a little five-gallon batch for you. Yeah, and and it's three bucks. Yeah, they're, they're cheap. So if, if you do want to kind of keg up a beer and get it drinking really, really fast, um, I do recommend um, adding some kind of a fining to it so that you can clear up that beer before it hits the keg. On the commercial scale, the only thing to think about is some people care about you know making sure they're using they're making vegan beers basically. Uh, in which case, you can use carrageenan, uh, Irish moss, Warflock, whatever, uh, super moss is what we use on the boil side, and then biofine, which is the same as Kiesel Sol. Biofine is the the vegan option for a clarifier, but again, it has a different polarity than Kytosan, so. It's kind of going to depend on what the pH of your beer is. Yep. Um, so, yeah, I, I think that uh, that answers the uh, how fast can you drink beer question. It's like yes and no. <laughs> uh, uh, beer. And I think that's it. Uh, shall we, shall we wrap her up? There's a lot more questions. Oh, is there? Yeah. Can you not read all those? Oh. Well, no, those are just comments. Those aren't questions. I can't digest a bitterness of my beers. Beer Church, something about Beer Church. Just want to, want some ideas on going from homebrewing to going pro. Oh, yeah. to go a little more in depth on the homebrewing to go to pro, I think that's something we can definitely kind of hit a little bit better because we kind of just said don't. But uh, if, from going homebrewing to going pro, uh, there, uh, first of all, there's a lot that you need to understand about the legality of all that. Um, it's going to take you a while. It's going to take you a while. And it really depends on your system and your, your budget is a really big part of it. Um, but from our experience, the best thing that I would say when going pro is start with location. You need to find a neighborhood that has a lot of, you know, a lot of traffic through it, but not necessarily, isn't necessarily like next to a freeway, right? Yeah. So I see what you're saying. we're right next to a slow moving neighborhood. Uh, we have a, there's an elementary school, like a hop, skip and a jump that way. There's a lot of apartments. There's a lot of people, a lot of homes right next to us. And uh, we're on one busy road and then one not so busy road. And, uh, and that works really well for us because we have a lot of people that can literally walk home that direction. Basically, if you've got a uh, hundred thousand dollars to, to make that work, be that neighborhood pub. Yeah. If you <laughs> honestly, I just don't recommend going into distro. There's a lot of people that open up going into distro. Yeah. If you have $2 million, then go, go ham. <laughs> well, no, if you have $2 million and you try to go into distro, you you're, better have a really good pup product and a really good marketing or else you're probably not going to make it. That's true. Marketing actually. Yeah. Hire like four marketers for yeah. you. If you have $2 million. Distro is so hard guys. Like this, like right now the beer market, I w I'm not going to say it's saturated, but the beer market is very, very, it's not saturated. It's highly competitive. Competitive. Yeah. That's, that's really the, the best way to describe it. And we're that. slowly but surely chipping away at the big boys. We're slowly, slowly but surely, you know, making our, our wedge into the Bud Light drinkers. But that said, your, your best bet is getting those high margin sales with a tap room. And your tap room is something you can think about as a marketing ploy too, even if you want to get into distribution later. Ooh, yeah. Sorry. Anyway, uh, did you answer that question? Yeah, I think we're good. Okay, because <laughs> I just saw a really good uh, question. Neighborhood pop up, brewery. Pop up from Evan. Yes, become a neighborhood brewery if you don't have a huge, huge budget to work with. Yeah. Um, and somebody was asking for tips on cleaning and storing carb stones, which is an absolutely fantastic questions because and that goes with our maintenance thing of yes a brewery. we have uh we have definitely dealt with our own carbstone issues i think every brewery deals with carbstone issues and yeah first and foremost before you plug your carbstone in every single time 
put it in a bucket of star sand and run some sort of gas through it to make sure it's working. Yep. That's, that's a great, great thing. Yeah. Put it through. Yeah. Some kind of a sanitizer, double check that it's working. Otherwise my best practice that I've actually found is that while I'm CIPing the tank, doing whatever kind of other maintenance I'm doing, I'll actually get a nice hot little side solution and I'll pull that carb stone out or side solution of um, just uh, PBW yeah. is, is all I actually use. And I'll actually take that carb stone out and I'll just let it soak in there. And I'll actually let it soak all day if I can, um, even overnight as a matter of fact, uh, more so than the typical CIP process would, Stop would do. Stop hitting the microphone. Yeah, sorry. Um, and that seems to make a world of difference for me. I literally see that solution. I see that kind of that beer stone, that protein buildup falling off the carb stone yep. when I'm doing that. And then it never hurts because it is a small solution that you're making up to give it a little bit of dunk in acid just to clean up any other uh, non, non, uh, organic yeah. bits that the might calcium be on. buildup or whatever. Yeah. The calcium buildup. Usually you won't have that as a bright or a carb stone, but yeah, we'll use the, so we'll use the, uh, the alkaline or the caustic or whatever, the PBW first, we'll leave it sitting in that for a long enough time to fully soak and saturate and eat up all that stuff. Uh, then we'll rinse it, dunk it in, uh, honestly, star sand is a great acid to work with. So we'll dunk it in star sand and then just make sure before we plug it back in, we run some gas through it, make sure it's flowing and then we plug it in. Pretty much, yeah. Um, that's yeah. my maintenance for carb stones right there. Um, yeah, I think just, just being regular about that, if I can, every time I clean. Um, and that's going to make a world of difference for you. Otherwise, if you, if you do get behind on it, it's going gonna, it's gonna to bite you in the butt. Uh, tips on brewery management software. Uh, what we did is we hired a Josh, and uh, he takes care of that. <laughs> It's <laughs> somewhat so, yeah. Uh, it's I don't know, yeah. We we really don't use much for software here. We don't. Um, yeah, we use uh, uh, what's it called? Brewer's Friend for all our recipes. Uh, we use Excel for all our spreadsheets that we use to manage and track our stuff. Uh, and we hired someone from the from a local college. To, QuickBooks. Yeah, QuickBooks. Lots of QuickBooks. Uh, QuickBooks definitely for uh, you know bookkeeping and everything like that. Uh, we actually use Square for our bar side of things, uh, and that's actually how we. Uh, ring up all our uh, recipe yeah. ingredients too, so we track costs that way. Uh, yeah, and then but yeah. we have a, a an awesome kid that wanted to be, a, you know, in the bartending kind of scene, in the beer scene, wanted to learn about that. But he's also really great with QuickBooks and yeah. creating Excel spreadsheets. Um, yeah, I think Square as a POS, if you are just a tap room, absolutely fantastic, hard to beat. Yeah. Um, I yeah, for us it's really tricky because we have the homebrew side of things here. Yeah. And so it just like comp it adds two levels and nobody really makes a POS that's smooth, but we have like 50,000 different in inventory items. And yeah. so square is, it's not the best for that, but it, it's functional. Nobody makes it because we're retail and a bar. Yeah, exactly. People make either retail or bar. They don't make, yeah, they don't make the, well, even nobody makes good retail software on the small scale. Honestly, that's true. Yeah. Like you have to get like really, really expensive before you get quality retail software. And then you've got to have like four people to manage it. Yeah, pretty much. But anyways, um, for the bar, we use square as our, uh, as our POS. And then, uh, yeah, we, we use Excel. We use QuickBooks. Yeah. Otherwise, yeah, it's the tough part I should say about like the supply side of things when it comes to trying to figure out, like, I don't know if this is what they're really asking, but, um, if they're trying to figure out like how to brew like a batch of this beer and then plan out the next batch, it's going to vary so much on you yeah. that, that that's, that's the unfortunate reality, the beer world, which, which like for us, the constant struggle is it's like, Oh crap, that beer went way too fast. We need to get another batch going. Oh wait, we need to order yeast for that batch. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Oh crap. Now we're out of the grains for that batch. And so it's, it's, a, it's, it's really paying attention to, I guess, seasonal changes, paying attention to, um, all kinds of different changes in and planning the, ahead for what you're uh, yeah, planning ahead. Yeah. yeah. So like, we'll, we'll think about like in March, we we're just, uh, in March, we, so we have weekly meetings. And so we'll say we have an event going on in March that we need to make sure we have this, this, whatever beer for, right. You know, our event could be a, a beer release. It could be a, you know, patio opening. It could be, it could yep. be whatever, but we plan ahead for those. And we say, what beer do we need on for this event? Um, we kind of work backwards from there. Or yep. if we blow through a beer super fast. Yeah, that, that's always a tricky part that you can never predict is that you have slow-moving beers and you have really fast-moving beers. Um, I think the very first, like, true hazy that we pulled all the stops out with, even before we moved to this location, um, was a one-barrel batch of beer that typically lasted us 
um, about six weeks at our old spot, right? Yeah. When we would do one barrel batches and it was gone in a week. Yep. Uh, literally all, well, I think we sold like one, like a quarter of it to somebody, but yeah, pr- otherwise yeah. all just tap room sales. And it's just because it was amazing beer and people wanted it. So somebody asked, is it still worth it to have the homebrew supply store and the brewery? Ooh, that's uh, a good question. So that's, that's a complicated <laughs> question because the homebrew supply store by itself would fail. It would not survive. Um, yep. And, and if you want to be in a, a really good walking area, you might be able to pick up a lot of sales that will help the homebrew supply side. But if we want to grow as a business and actually be able to pay ourselves a reasonable wage, then we have to have the brewery side as well. Yeah. Uh, and this is a trend that's happened across the country. Uh, I want to say f- four or five years ago is kind of when it started to tip. Uh, yep. When we first opened up the homebrew supply store, it did really well. But then, you know, Amazon hit big. Big companies like Sears went out of business, uh, like Macy's, like uh, all those big department stores started going out of business because everything has gone online right now. AB InBev bought Northern Brewer. <laughs> So you've got, you've got a lot of options to buy stuff. Uh, that said, our homebrew supply store is a great marketing tool as well. And since we had all the inventory as well, being a homebrew supply store and a brewery actually helps bring in more drinking customers. Yeah. Uh, which goes into the next question, what actually makes us more money, the homebrew supply store or the bar? The bar. Yep. The bar does, um, unfortunately. In, in terms of overall sales, the homebrew supply store is probably a little bit higher. Um, we do a little bit more in sales in the homebrew supplies than we do in the beer. But that said, the margin on the beer is a lot higher. Uh, yeah. And so the beer is a really great way to actually notice uh, a return on investment from our labor. Because when we make beer and sell beer, we make money. Whereas the homebrew supply store, it's a lot of hurry up and wait. It's a lot of, you know, let's stock this new item and try to like pump this out. We're going to, you know, do a lot with draft equipment, with kegerators, with things like that. Yeah. And, uh, you know, sometimes it works right away and you get some people picking it up. And sometimes it's like four or five months later, somebody might buy something. And in which case you're like, do I discontinue this item? Do I not carry it anymore? Yeah. Which is why I honestly, oh, as my voice is cracking. Um, Somebody's as, uh, going through puberty. <laughs> which is why you really need to support your local homebrew store. Um, yeah. Because while, yes, you might be able to buy a kettle, a $250 kettle online <clears throat> for 5 or $10 less than your local homebrew store, um, by buying it from your local homebrew store, you're actually keeping those guys afloat. Because I guarantee you, unless they're some giant conglomerate like Northern Brewer or more beer than uh, they're, they're really not making a lot of money. They're probably not even paying themselves minimum wage. Yep. It's yeah, it's, it's really hard with just the supply store by itself. A lot of our big ticket items we've actually stopped carrying because people, people are going to buy it online. It's easier for them to go online, yeah. which oh, I don't blame them. You know, the frustrating part on that for me is that sometimes people will buy it online and they'll see something that says it's normally this price, but it's on sale now for this price. And they don't realize that we could still have it for less or we could still have it for the same amount. So the same amount. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And they're like, Oh, I just got this great deal on this, whatever yeah. it's going to be. And then, you know, we are like, Hey, we've had that for a lower price as our standard price in the store this entire time and actually would have made some good money on that. But yep. thanks for coming and telling us about it. <laughs> yeah. And especially because if you give them that, if you basically throw your local homebrew store a bone yeah. every, every now and then, um, that's going to keep those otherwise much cheaper grains, uh, especially available to you because that's yeah. what, that's the one downside is that if you're, if your local homebrew shop goes out of business, um, you no longer have access to exceptionally cheap malt to work with. Um, which if you buy online or if you looked at online is pretty stupidly expensive. So we try to t- take care of our people by having a really wide variety of ingredients. And that works out really well being both a brewery and a homebrew supply store because we can bring in new ingredients and people can try them out while we have them. And then if it doesn't sell, we can brew with it. We get a new experience. We get to make some fun new beers and learn about malts. And on the YouTube side, we get to teach you about new malts or, or whatever. So we get to experiment a lot with that while still creating a really great experience for our homebrew customers. Um, but, uh, yeah, if we didn't, uh, couldn't keep the homebrew supply side alive, we wouldn't be able to do both of those things and we wouldn't be able to make as dynamic range of beer as we can. Yeah. And somebody's asking about liquid yeast too. And, uh, that has more or less been my job for the last probably couple, <clears throat> couple, three years now. And, uh, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's a pain in the butt, but the beauty of us is that we have the brewery. So I try to hold things in stock that I know are going to move. And then I try to actually purposely overstock a few things a few yeasts that I know that we love to use so that if they do start getting even close to their sell by dates, which is also why I love Imperial because they have a four month shelf life on them. 
Um, but yeah, if they even start getting to the point of like three months, we pull them out, we build them up and we use them here. So, I mean, I can guarantee you, we probably have some of the freshest yeast in the state nonetheless. With, with the biggest selection. Yeah. With the biggest selection as we, well. We, we carry a full range of both Y yeast and Imperial. And that's, that's exactly why we're able to do it is because, you know, we'll, every time we're doing a big batch and we're like kind of brainstorming, we work backwards from the yeast. We'll like pick through being like, all right, this one's almost three months old. This one's, you know, uh, over three months old and we will formulate what we can do with those yeasts when we decide to make our beer yeah so yep pretty much um so that's kind of the beauty of what we have going for us um somebody's saying their local homebrew shop is northern brewer but they closed <laughs> yeah sorry about that um and just jumped on oh where are you guys located um <laughs> We are, we're, yeah, we're located in Spokane, Washington. Uh, it's Washington, but not the side that Seattle's on. <laughs> we're on, the, like, the super cold and dry side or super cold and hot side, depending on the time of year. It's super dry and hot side. Yeah, that's what I meant. <laughs> super cold. We're, we're on the super cold and hot side. <laughs> Damn it, Peter's feeding me beer again. All right. What? Um, I think that probably will yeah, be a good questions. stopping point for us on this week. Thanks again for tuning in to our concurrent 70 viewers. Uh, we really appreciate it. Please. And, yeah, every week we're doing this every Sunday at 8.45 is when we're aiming for. Yeah. So even if I accidentally start the live stream yesterday, uh, don't don't tune in then. Tune in Sundays <laughs> at 8.45. Tune in Sundays, 8.45 Pacific Standard Time. Pacific Standard Time, yeah. Yes, because, you know, this is the global thing. So, uh, yeah, I think that's it for this week. Cheers. Um, hopefully that was a good chat. And, and if you want to uh, find us on Instagram – Genus Brewing, use the hashtag Genus Rate My Beer and tag us in posts about your brewing, whatever's, and then we will, you will share it to our stories. All right. We'll see you next week with some fun new topics. That's right. Cheers, guys. Cheers. All done. Do I stop it? You use the mouse. Oh. And you say, yeah. end stream.